Good evening. It is April 11th, 2024, and I'd like to welcome you to the meeting of the South Brunswick Board of Education and to call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. All right, the statement of advance notice, the New Jersey Open Public Meeting Act, NJSBA, 10-4-6, also known as the Sunshine Law, was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. The primary purpose is for board members to discuss and vote on board business. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the board secretary has caused notice of this meeting 48 hours prior including date, time, and location to be posted in the South Brunswick Public Library, the board office filed with the township clerk and communicated to the Home News Tribune and the Star-Ledger. It is also posted on the district website. Mr. Pawlowski, may I have roll call? Ms. Julie Flora. Present. Ms. Laura Hernandez. Here. Ms. Deepa Karthik. Ms. Alicia Khan. Here. Mr. Raja Krishna. Mr. Mike Mitchell. Mr. Barry Nathanson. Dr. Smitha Raj? Here. Mrs. Lisa Rogers? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, sir. May I have a motion and a second to approve tonight's agenda? Motion. Motion by Ms. Hernandez, second by Dr. Raj. All in favor? Aye. Any nay? Moving on. The next item is uh, executive session. Note, please wait. Note. <laughs> please wait until I read the statement to leave the dais. May I have a motion good to go into executive session? Moved, Dr. Raj, Alicia, Ms. Alicia Khan, second. All in favor? Aye. Very good. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Township of South Brunswick hereby moves into an executive session in accordance with the Sunshine Law, Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975, NJSA 10-4-6 through 10-4-21, to discuss the following, student discipline matter. Be it resolved that the discussion conducted in the executive session can be disclosed to the public at such time as the matters have been resolved. Formal action may be taken at the meeting. We will return. Good evening, South Brunswick. May I have a motion to reopen the South Brunswick Board of Education meeting? Motion to reconvene. Mr. Mitchell, second. Ms. Ferrara, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Okay. I, I would like to make a motion to uh, amend the agenda and add uh, the student discipline matter to the executive session scheduled for later. So moved. May I have a second? Second, Ms. Khan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Motion moves. Okay. All righty. Our next order of business. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Pawlowski, uh, draft of the minutes were posted and distributed to the board. Are there any corrections to the minutes as posted? I see none. The minutes stand as written and are approved. The next order of business is the student representative, Defan Lee. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so starting off with some news from the high school. Our Spring Spirit Week started off strong on Monday with Lazy Day, Tuesday with Black and Gold Day, today with Destination Day, and ending tomorrow with Color Wars. Our Spring Pep Rally will be taking place tomorrow on April 12th with performances from Jazz Band, Visual Ensemble, Temptation, Mr. SBHS Participants, and uh, Staff Prom Court. Last Friday, HOSA's Family Feud Game Show Night had more than 400 attendees with pizza and boba sales and raised approximately $4,000 to donate to a South Brunswick family in need. The Viking Leadership Alliance Food Drive raised 2,000 pounds of food to donate to replenish the Middlesex County Food Pantry. Today, the mental health fair was hosted in the alcove of the high school and was available all day for students to enjoy and de-stress. The fair included therapy dogs, arts and craft stations, informational booths, and fun activities. SB Earth is excited to present Upcycle Night on April 16th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Blue Cafeteria. The event will include tie-dye and pot painting, and pre-sale tickets will be available tomorrow during all lunches. The, the 19th annual K-12 Student Art Show will be hosted in the high school main gym on Wednesday, April 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. 
uh, that's all I have for everyone today, and I wish you all a great night. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay, the next order is the report of the president. Um, just a few things for the board members. Uh, the Middlesex County School Board's meeting will be on Wednesday, May 1st, if you'd like to attend. They are honoring the Middlesex County Teacher of the Year, who is from North Brunswick, Julie Mercier. So we congratulate Julie on that. Speaking of honors, we would like to congratulate Mr. Mike Mitchell um, on his receipt of becoming the master board member. Yay. Um, for those that don't know, it takes a lot of hard work um, to become a master board member, and we're really proud of Mike uh, that he's achieved it. So welcome to the club, Mike. Thank you. Yep. Um, finally, all just for the board members, um, keeping up with the latest news in Trenton, uh, the Department of Education Acting Commissioner Kevin Deemer will be testifying before the Assembly, or excuse me, he testified before the Assembly Budget Committee yesterday, and he'll also be testifying again to the Senate on April 16th. If anyone is interested to see um, his words or comments, you can watch the live proceedings by going to the New Jersey Legislature site. <clears throat> also, just a, on a note, recently, um, and I want the board to be aware of this, an open letter was sent to the governor and signed by multiple organizations regarding the opposition to bills A4500, um, 4144. Um, it seems that the, despite the careful language that's been crafted, it is a voucher program. And that is designed to subsidize private schools by offering tax credits to individual donors, which in effect diminishes the funds available at a time when many public schools, including South Brunswick, have had massive cuts. Uh, the Education Law Center has launched a vigorous opposition to these bills, sending a letter to the governor and other public officials. If you're interested in reading the release, um, I urge you to go to the website, insidernj.com. There is a press release. The opposition spans the country, including folks from Texas, Arizona, and Illinois. So if anybody's interested to understand that, please go ahead and uh, take a moment to read that. That's all I have for tonight. And next is the report of the superintendent. <coughs> Ah, welcome. So all I seem to do these days is give bad news. So tonight we're going to start with good news. Um, the people in this audience, a lot of these people, who, who's here because they kind of won something? Come on. <laughs> Darius, get your hand up. Yeah. yeah every year we do this, and uh, this, um, Blair will take, take us home with that. But, you know, in, in times where right now things are not very cheerful, it is important to take time to celebrate. And while we're only celebrating a few tonight, um, I could have all the, all the staff members, you know, I won't do that. But we could be celebrating any number of hundreds and hundreds of our staff. They're that talented a group. So tonight, we celebrate before I do what I have to do. So we start with celebration, and uh, I'm going to give a few announcements before we get that going. But thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, some of you might be here for a budget talk, but you get to have this experience first of hearing about our wonderful staff, so that's awesome. Um, another positive, um, it seems every year our music program wins uh, what's called from the NAM Foundation, um, honored as one of the best communities for music education in the country. Um, it's the 25th year, and it's really a, an amazing thing to keep doing year after year. Do we have any music educators here tonight? Any music educators? Well, they don't really, you know, they're busy there. <laughs> How about any students that are involved in the music program? There, you go. there we go. Oh, we have one that used to be involved in the music program, was that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's still seen involved. So it, it really is one of the most, if you've never heard one of our bands, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter if it's an elementary school band, or the high school marching band, or one of our special high school bands, or middle school bands. It's amazing, and it's a well-deserved award. Uh, another note, on April 17th next week, we have the Joanne Kirkus Student Art Gallery. If you've never been to that, that is a must. It is insane. And all of our art teachers take the students' work, and they basically decorate the gym, and it's, it's insane. It's well worth it. If you, even if you don't have kids involved in it, just come. It'll just make you smile. Uh, we have a parent academy on April 23rd. This is Autism Acceptance Month. I like that it's not called Autism Awareness Month. And um, that's just really important. For about 50 years, that's been going on. But the importance of acknowledging um, the ever-growing population of autistic students and their families is really important. So um, we definitely accept them here and, and do an amazing job with educating them as well. 
Another note, April 25th is take your, take your child to work day. And the last thing I would have is budget. So I'm gonna hold and I'm gonna end inviting up Marty Abschutz and Bobby Bender, our regulars representing the Ed Foundation. And here comes the helmet. Now I can do it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Federer, for allowing us to speak for a few minutes tonight about the Education Foundation's upcoming event. My name is Bobby Binder, and I'm the treasurer of the Education Foundation. The Tour to South Brunswick will take place on Sunday, June 2nd, starting at the high school. I've already put in my request for a sunny day at work last year, so we're hoping that it works again for this year. Once again, we have three routes. The 25-mile route, heads out towards Route 27, starts at the high school, and winds through Kensal Park, Monmouth Junction, and Dayton, with a rest stop at Eagles Landing Day Camp on Davidson Mill Road. The 10-mile route mostly circles Dayton, and the four-mile route is across the street from the high school and offers a shorter two-mile route as well. Details about this event can be found at our website, edfoundationsb.org. For those of you unfamiliar with the Tour de South Brunswick, I'll give you a very quick history. It started in 2011, and we had about 20 participants. Since then, our numbers have swelled, and before the pandemic of 2020, we had over 800 people participating. We've definitely gained a lot of momentum over the last few years, and we're hoping to continue that trend. And this year, we had a uh, poster contest uh, that was open to third through fifth graders. And there were, we had more than 70 submissions. Our winner was announced last month right here from this podium. And for those who missed it, it was C Sirat K from Greenbrook, a fifth grader, was our winner. Her, post, her poster has been featured in all of our uh, me, uh, media and, uh, uh, and our um, advertising. advertising for the ride. Thank what you, What about all the other posters that were submitted, Marty? Oh, yeah. So the other 70 posters were going to be uh, shown at, at the event on June 2nd. We'll have them all there. And you can also see the names of all the participants on our website, again, at edfoundationsb.org. Uh, they'll be on display again in, at, at the tour on June 2nd. So we have a modest charge for this event. And then give some of the money back to the physical education departments in, in the participating schools. So for those of you that sign up, make sure you pick the school that your child, your child is working at, is, is at, or was at, so that they get the benefit of you participating uh, with them as the registered school. And that will ensure that they get the grant money for the participation in the phys ed department. And after all these years of riding and coming up here to make the presentation, I will remind everyone that while riding any distance in the Tour de South Brunswick or any time that you are out riding your bicycle, helmets are 100% required. Thank you. So, <clears throat> just, just want to add that registration is now open. So go to edfoundationsb.org and register. And thank you. Your support. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, um, it's time for the recognition. So this recognition is for 2023-2024 educators and the support persons of the year. And I'd like to ask the Blair Eisman, the Director of Professional Development, step up. Good evening, everyone, members of the board, our honorees, their friends, family, and colleagues, and everyone tuning in from home. As Lisa said, I'm Blair Eisman, Director of Programs and Professional Development, and I have the honor of recognizing this year's Educators and Educational Support People of the Year. This is a time-honored tradition in South Brunswick, dating back to 1996. Each year, staff, students, and parents are invited to submit letters nominating staff members across the district. A selection committee then has the difficult task of reading hundreds of nominations, we were just under 500 this year, and scoring them on a given set of criteria. In the end, just 24 are selected, two honorees from each school and two at the district level. 
Tonight's honorees inspire learning on a grand scale and make a difference in the lives of students, colleagues, and the school community with their caring support and unwavering work ethic. They are leaders, highly skilled, and dedicated to the profession. Thank you to our nomination writers and readers, as well as our administrators who surprised each honoree in their building with the special announcement and for being here tonight. Thank you to Supervisor Rob Sears and our music department for helping me set the stage tonight. To our Board of Education for their support, Marianne Murphy, and to my assistant, Rachel Kalibas, for all of the behind the scenes work that is truly months in the making. A special thank you to the PTO from each building. They purchased one of the honorees gifts, a desk name plate for them to display proudly wherever they choose. And they also made a small donation in their honor. I'm so grateful for your continued support of this program and that you always kindly agree to be a part of this tradition. An equally special thank you to our Ed Foundation of South Brunswick for their generosity. They reached out a couple of years ago wanting to co-sponsor this event for our staff and kindly continue, continue to do so. They purchased the second gift that our honorees will receive. It's a framed print that you'll see up here in a few minutes that ties to our theme for the evening. Please visit edfoundationsb.org to learn more about their work and how you could support the foundation. In the past, I've found my inspiration for this recognition program in books, teachers' lessons, and in our very own students. This year, and she'll be very happy to know this, I actually found inspiration in my mom. When I was out for a walk sometime in the early fall, I noticed the trees starting to change colors. I smiled to myself thinking about a time my mom wasn't happy with me because I didn't appreciate the trees that she pointed out on our drive. In my defense, I think I was about nine and we were on our way to camp, which I wasn't thrilled about. But now I do stop and notice. And on the particular walk I mentioned, I started to think about what makes trees worth noticing. Trees play a critical role in the balance of our systems. They nurture growth and provide shelter and essentials. They literally breathe life into the world. They have deep roots that extend beyond what we can see. Those roots are an anchor. Trees have branches that reach out in all directions. They are resilient, changing with the seasons and weathering many storms. Trees are pillars that we look up to, solid, strong, and consistent. They offer a sense of calm and awe, comfort and peace, inspiration and hope. There are many kinds of trees, all unique. They are beautiful, standing on their own. And when you put them together, they're breathtaking and powerful. The same could be said about our educators and educational support people, their importance, their impact, their influence, the ways in which they give so selflessly. Tonight's honorees play a critical role here among staff, students, and colleagues, and their work and character are known and recognized. Tonight, we stop to appreciate their colors and all they do for the South Brunswick community every day and in every way. So as I celebrate each honoree tonight, I'll share with you a tree chosen for them and why, the framed print from the Ed Foundation that they'll be receiving, and the donation I spoke of earlier from the PTO was made to the Arbor Day Foundation, a tree planting nonprofit aiming to plant 500 million trees by 2027 in areas that they are needed most. But first, I'd like to ask Mrs. Rogers to join me to help congratulate our honorees. And I'll also ask Brooks Crossing and Brunswick Acres honorees and administrators to stand along the wall here with me. And as one school sits down, the next one can come up. So without further ado, I will start at Brooks Crossing with Mrs. Vanessa Nepomuceno, third grade teacher. Mrs. Nepomuceno is being gifted the coconut tree. A coconut tree stands tall in adversity and hardship. It is a symbol of loyalty and faith. Coconut trees give protection to those who seek it. They inspire us to embark on a meaningful journey within ourselves. In India and in the Philippines, a coconut tree is seen as providing all the necessities of life. Mrs. Nepomuceno represents each of these things and more. A former student and now high school senior wrote, she possesses a rare combination of qualities that define her as outstanding. 
Despite the passage of time, her impact remains profound and her contributions are immeasurable. She has left an indelible mark on my life. Congratulations. Ms. Swati Maharana is a behavior technician at Brooks Crossing Elementary School. She is being gifted the banyan tree. The banyan tree represents growth, strength, and reflection. It continually grows stronger roots and reaches new heights, taking up all the space it is meant to. Mrs. Maharana has navigated her role with grace and professionalism. She is eager to learn and shows patience in the most challenging situations, and she inspires those around her to be better. Congratulations. <laughs> Miss Karen Petraconis is a fifth grade teacher at Brunswick Acres Elementary. She is being gifted the sequoia tree. A sequoia tree is both gentle and courageous. It is seen as being meant to help us ignite our creative passion by tapping into our own wisdom and strength. It's a symbol of protection and longevity. Ms. Petraconis is known as a warrior for her students and a leader amongst her colleagues. Her reach extends beyond the four walls of her classroom. A student wrote that she is a phenomenal teacher, not just because she could teach, but because of the support, empathy, and love she shows to her students. Congratulations. <laughs> Mrs. Denise Gable is a paraprofessional for students with autism at Brunswick Acres Elementary. She is being gifted the maple tree. Maple trees symbolize love, loyalty, strength, and endurance. Mrs. Gable is meticulous in her role. She is everyone's go-to person, and she has dedicated herself to her colleagues and students. Maple leaves have beautiful colors that change with the seasons. She embraces change and exemplifies professionalism. Congratulations. <laughs> Ms. Jill Kerwin is the school nurse at Cambridge Elementary School. She is being gifted the willow tree. The wood of the willow tree is highly valued for its strength and flexibility. The delicate leaves and graceful branches also evoke a sense of peace and tranquility, which students feel when they visit her office. A willow tree is often depicted as a mystical tree with healing powers, which is fitting for a nurse, I'd say. Ms. Kerwin's knowledge in her field is a gift to Cambridge and the district. Just like the shade of a willow tree, staff and students alike find comfort in her care. Congratulations. <laughs> Ms. Paquita Tisdale is a special education paraprofessional at Cambridge Elementary School. She is being given the birch tree. The birch tree is a symbol for new beginnings and growth. The striking white bark is strong, and overall, the tree helps others feel lifted and motivated with the lightness it brings. Ms. Tisdale supports the growth of her students and is consistently looking to continue her own learning as well. Her strength and encouragement are just some of her positive contributions. Congratulations to you. Miss Oneza Bassett is a preschool teacher at Constable Elementary School. She is being given the cherry blossom tree. Cherry blossom trees symbolize the start of a new season. As her preschool students transition to school for the first time, she has laid a positive foundation for them as learners and kind humans. Cherry blossom trees are also inspirational and admired the same way Miss Bassett is. Someone wrote that she has created an atmosphere where curiosity is nurtured, mistakes are stepping stones, and students know their self-worth. Congratulations. Ms. Jennifer Gibbons is a safety paraprofessional at Constable Elementary School. She is being given the oak tree. Oak trees symbolize strength, endurance, and wisdom, and a favorite of Mrs. Rogers, I hear her whispering back here. The trunk rises tall and proud, branching out into a canopy of leaves that provides shelter and protection to those beneath it. Miss Gibbons is a strong presence for her students. She has a calming influence and is consistently steady. One student in particular who faces challenges looks for her every day. 
He knows he is cared for. Everything Miss Gibbons does is not to be recognized. It's simply because of her love for children. Congratulations. Mrs. Lisa Jorgensen is the speech and language specialist at Dayton and Dean's Preschool. She is being gifted the fig tree. In Roman times, fig trees were believed to increase the strength of, the, of young people. Fig trees are a symbol of abundance and encourage creating for the greater good. Mrs. Jorgensen has an abundance of knowledge in which she shares so freely with staff and parents. She aims for inclusion and independence for our youngest learners. Someone wrote she is thoughtful and, and intentional, is motivating, and she builds students' confidence. She creates a positive school experience for all. Congratulations. Ms. Rashonda Wade, are you here tonight? All right, we will make sure uh, Mrs. Plummer brings her gift to her, but I'm still gonna recognize her here tonight. Ms. Rashonda Wade is a bus driver for our youngest riders at Dayton Indians Preschool. She is being given the apple tree. In ancient mythology, the apple tree is a symbol for good health, future happiness, and a place for rest and shelter. The apple is a favorite and well-known for good reason, and so is Ms. Wade. She helps our spirited three and four-year-olds transitioning to and from school. She is trusted by parents and created a nurturing and comfortable environment for students. Her bus is a safe haven and she ensures students are greeted with a smile and love every day. Her positivity and caring nature are beyond appreciated. We congratulate her. Mrs. Lori Colquist is a second grade teacher at Greenbrook Elementary School. She is being given the bonsai tree. It was very hard not to include a karate kid quote. The bonsai tree is a symbol of strength and conveys harmony and patience. It also represents a lifetime commitment to patience and dedication, as well as the idea of balance. Mrs. Colquist is a veteran educator who cares about the academic and social emotional well-being of her students. She aims to inspire her students to be the best versions of themselves. A parent wrote, Mrs. Colquist has found a way to get students to push themselves forward while maintaining autonomy over their learning. Congratulations to you. Mrs. Pushpa Flint is the Student Information Secretary at Greenbrook. She is being gifted the American Chestnut Tree, which signals a time of trust and providing for ourselves and our community by offering stability and kindness. Mrs. Flint does just that to anyone that enters Greenbrook's main office. She is efficient, trusted, friendly, and flexible. Her input and work ethic is valued. Congratulations to you. Mrs. Joan Kilui is a kindergarten teacher at Indian Fields. She is being given the bristlecone tree. Because of their enduring nature, bristlecone trees are known to impart such wisdom and remind us to be a person of integrity and truth. Mrs. Kilui has been instilling core values such as these in her colleagues and students for over 30 years. There is a deep sense of family in her classroom where everyone belongs. Students remember how she made them feel years and years later. What greater gift. Congratulations. <laughs> Mrs. Shirley Walker is a safety paraprofessional at Indian Fields Elementary School. She is being gifted the elm tree. You like that one too? That's a good one too. <laughs> <laughs> when at its fullest, the tree's form be um, becomes a beautiful vase. The elm tree is a symbol for communication, relationships, adaptation, and balance. Mrs. Walker brings balance to Indian Fields every day. She is an innovative thinker, and her leadership during lunch and recess is one of the reasons it is, quote unquote, a well oiled machine. The time, attention, and care she gives to staff and students does not go unnoticed, and we congratulate you. <laughs> you. 
Mrs. Carly Rabby is a special education teacher at Mama Junction Elementary. She is being given the spruce tree. The spirit of a spruce tree reminds us of our inner resilience and not to give up, something she teaches her students and embodies herself. Spruce trees symbolize kindness, friendship, and protection. Long ago during the winter solstice, spruce trees were brought into people's homes for life and light. Mrs. Rabby is a bright light for the Mama Junction community. All students feel respected, accepted, and protected. Her colleagues learn from her every day. Her gentle and nurturing manner mixed with her experience of working with students with special needs and her knowledge is celebrated. Congratulations. Mrs. Deborah Slavin couldn't be here tonight, but we still want to celebrate her. She is a special education paraprofessional at Mama Junction Elementary. She is being gifted the magnolia tree. Magnolia symbolize luck, stability, and nobility. The blossoms symbolize determination and are known as the mother of all flowering plants on earth. Mrs. Slavin treats each student as if they are her own children. Her relentless efforts and unwavering work ethic is consistently evident in all she does. Her students are fortunate to have her and are successful because of her experience and care. So congratulations to her. Mrs. Kristen Cornett is a math teacher for seventh and eighth grade students at Crossroads North Middle School. She is being given the ginkgo tree, which is a symbol of peace, hope, and vitality. The beautiful fan-shaped leaves are unique and distinct. The ginkgo tree is respected, as is Mrs. Cornett. She is beyond committed to her colleagues and students, her content knowledge, instructional delivery, and overall way to personalize learning is celebrated. She leads and supports her team, shows kindness to children and everyone around her, and is truly a model educator. Congratulations. Mrs. Rashmi Jamanchi is a safety paraprofessional at Crossroads North Middle School. She is being given the olive tree. Olive trees are generous and robust. They are a symbol of peace and the essence of all things good. Mrs. John Manchi truly brings good to Crossroads North. Her genuine nature, vigilant presence, and proactive approach are just a few of her strengths. She makes it a point to personally reach out to staff and students, extending those branches. Mrs. John Manchi's kindness radiates in all she does while putting student safety and accountability first. Congratulations. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly Fortune is a physical education teacher at Crossroads South Middle School as well as a coach in the district. She is being given the baobab tree, which is known for taking on many roles. The striking silhouette of a baobab tree at sunset is a familiar sight in Africa. Think Lion King. It is a symbol of strength and presence. Mrs. Fortune, well known as a dedicated role model with a positive approach to supporting students. Mrs. Fortune established a volleyball program and is a tremendous support to our Special Olympics athletes as the organizer of Unified Vikings Bowling. Congratulations. Mrs. Caroline Malak is a special education paraprofessional at Crossroads South Middle School. She is being given the General Sherman tree, which is a type of sequoia. General Sherman trees are filled with a lot of history and great wonder. They are strong and supportive. Mrs. Malak is an integral part of students' daily successes. She is consistent, encouraging, and patient. A parent wrote, Mrs. Malak's devotion to her students is unparalleled, and we consider ourselves lucky that our child has had the privilege of working with her on a daily basis. Congratulations. Mrs. Karen Slater teaches multilingual learners at South Brunswick High School. She is being given the sycamore tree. 
The spiritual meaning of the sycamore tree lies in its roots, teaching us to embrace our past and honor our heritage. It also embraces change. Mrs. Slater is an advocate and voice for students new to the district and oftentimes the country, learning the English language for the first time. She is persistent, patient, and empathetic, and creates an environment where her students know they are safe, they are cared for, and they belong here. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Darius Gilliam is a safety paraprofessional at South Brunswick High School. He is being given the orange tree. Orange trees are associated with kindness, loyalty, and generosity. If you visited SBHS, you most likely have experienced his genuine spirit and smile. Someone wrote, his enthusiasm makes it hard, hard to have a bad day in his presence. As an SBHS graduate, Mr. Darius, as he is fondly known, takes great pride in the building, the students, and his work. He knows and cares for all. He jumps in to help whenever, wherever, and he has high expectations for students and models passion and professionalism. Congratulations. <laughs> One of his letters also called him an icon. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Amy Wish, math specialist, is our district educator of the year. She is being given the lemon tree, which represents a time of purpose, clarity, and action. She makes lemonade out of every situation, <laughs> and her extensive knowledge is the fruit her colleagues and students quote unquote pick and devour. Congratulations. Last but certainly not least, Mrs. Cherie Gaither is a bus driver and our district support person of the year. She is being given eucalyptus. Eucalyptus is a symbol of strength and protection. Eucalyptus gets its name from the Greek word eu, which means good, well, and true. The roots can extract gold from soil, and Mrs. Gaither is pure gold. She sees every child as her own. She knows the importance of her role, saying, I'm the first one they see after their families in the morning. I have to look out for them. This one's hard. <laughs> I can't let them start their day in a bad way. She empowers older students to look out for each other and has created a take care of one another culture on her bus. She is a true exemplar of what a bus driver can be and how the right driver can make the bus ride fun, safe, and encouraging. Congratulations. <laughs> On that sweet note, this concludes tonight's recognition program. Please give all of our honorees another round of applause. Yep. Don't, don't say my stuff now. Don't take away my stuff. Thank you all for being here to celebrate them with us, and have a good night. So just before anyone, don't leave. Don't leave. Um, <laughs> If you, this was like literally handcrafted by Blair. Yeah. That means she, yeah. Just. And I, it's hard not to notice the, the level of care she put into each one of these individuals that she takes from the information she gleans from the nominations and what she knows and from the administration and other staff members and makes it individual for each one. And that is an incredible job. Yes. Thank you. Great job.
Blair. Also, I echo Mr. Federer's words. Thank you on the behalf of the Board of Ed. That was an exceptional presentation. Um, every single tree there, I'm sure, made people <laughs> smile. And for the people that were getting the award, I bet they were thinking, I wonder what tree I'm going to get. <laughs> <laughs> so you did a fantastic job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And to those that have won the award tonight, on behalf of the Board of Education, the members present tonight, thank you. Thank you for everything you do for our kids. It's people like you that make parents smile. Um, I know that every single staff member in this district does everything they can to support our children. So thank you on behalf of the board, again, for doing an exceptional job. And um, those trees were just fantastic. Um, I didn't know some of them existed. But <laughs> um, and you, we all have our favorites. So, um, but thank you again for everything you do. And if you get a chance, go say hi to Darius in the parking lot. <laughs> um, so with that, we're going to be moving on to the budget. We do hope you all stay. Um, we know you have class tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know if you have homework, but um, you're more than welcome to stay. I will take five minutes, maybe two minutes, uh, just to, for us to, if anybody wants to exit, you feel free, and then we'll resume. Thank you again. Okay, thank you again, um, everyone, for coming out this evening. Uh, next, uh, Scott is going to provide an update on the uh, budget presentation. After he's finished, there will be a Q&A session on the budget presentation only. Um, also, you may see some of the board members looking at their screens. We've received the budget presentation. So uh, just know that we'll be reading it from here, or of course, any member here can, can view it on the screen. Thank you, Mr. Fetter. All right, welcome everyone. Um, so, I just want to go through this, is, and just to be clear on what this is, this this statement has been made by multiple senators, assembly, even a, mo a state funding monitor in one of the school districts, that the issue we're currently facing is a revenue issue, not a spending issue, and that's just an important concept. But I want to go through what tonight is going to be, and then the one thing it is not going to be. It is going to be we're going to be sharing the general impact of cutting $6.2 million. We're going to share a little bit about what the future might look like, some current legislation, some advocacy, and then as you heard uh, from President Rogers, we're going to hold a Q&A. During the Q&A, you're permitted to come up here if you're, going to, if you're going to do that. At any point you realize you're going to have a question or want to make a comment, just kind of slide over down over here, and then we'll line up over here at the end if there's anyone who wants to um, ask a question or make a comment. Um, but I just want to be really clear about one thing, and that's what this is not. I will not answer questions. I will not entertain topics around why the situation is the way it is. The reason is we provided that to you on multiple occasions. We've sent it to you. We've invited you to meetings. We assume everybody already knows that answer. So to keep this focused on the issue at hand, which is the cuts and what they look like, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, okay? If you have questions about why this is the way it is, we're going to, we're going to first ask you to watch one of the videos, watch any of the testimony, and then feel free to ask questions at another time. It will not be tonight. The next meeting that we'll be talking about the full context of the budget, including why, how we got here, and all of the information, will be on May 7th at a budget hearing. On May 7th at the budget hearing, that is when the Board of Education is asked to adopt a final budget to be submitted to the state. That's kind of where we are. So with that said, let's just look at what this is. This is $6.2 million. There's no easy way to do this. There's no fun way to do this. I don't really have any good news to share, unfortunately. Maybe a little bit, but it isn't great. We're starting with 65 staff positions that are currently scheduled to be cut. Now, when we talk about staff positions, there are also things like attrition. Attrition is a word when somebody leaves the district for any number of reasons. They could be retiring, um, could be moving out of state, resigning their position for any reason. This is not about, this is positions. As of right now, at $6.2 million, we are at 65 positions. And the reason it's not higher is because we have tried to do everything else other than cut 
staff, or programs. We have not been able to reach the same success we've had in all the previous years because at some point you just can't keep cutting. And we've been cutting for six straight years. Let's just look a little bit more into that. The cuts are coming in the way of classroom teachers, all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. All schools are affected, some more than others, based upon various concepts, but it's all through the district. Special education teachers are part of that. Then there are administrative positions, supervisor positions. These are all things that are being cut. Custodial and maintenance positions, secretarial staff, paraprofessional staff, club advisors, coaches, which are direct impact to students. Security, no one wants to lose security. In fact, we know there are four things you don't want to lose. You don't want to put kids at risk or staff at risk, security, safety. We don't want to lose academic programs. We don't want to lose extracurriculars. We don't want to deal with mental health. $6.2 million, it's not happening. There's no way to keep everything clean at $6.2 million. And there's going to be other staff involved as part of that 65 plus positions. So what does it look like? What does that mean? So the biggest thing you're going to see is increased class size. And I'm going to go over specifically how each level is being hit with class size. We are currently scheduled to completely cut the entire elementary G&T program completely gone. It'll be done in another way, whatever way we can legally do. We're losing instructional people. We're losing para people that help kids in many, many different ways. This is some amorphous for some people, but we have a very liberal approach to students choosing their courses. We allow them to make changes, we do what we can, we open up new sections. That is not happening. Student makes a choice, they're going to be living with that choice. We're going to be closing sections. We will cut off at a number and that will be that. There will be no more students entering those courses. That is a horrible thing to do, absolutely horrible. But if we don't do it, then we have to open up more sections and we can't open up any more sections. Discipline and HIV, when you cut administrators, the people that deal with when there's discipline and HIV, we're not going to have as many people doing it. So it is going to have an impact. It all has an impact. I know like in generally when you talk about a budget cut, you're going to have people, probably people in this audience or people at home, that say just cut all the administrators. Listen, I, I, I would be glad to go first right now, honestly. Take, take, take me. You can't just cut all of one anything. It doesn't work. But we are taking from every single part of the district. I think the only group that we did not take from are drivers, actually. I think drivers are the one group um, that we did not um, have to take. So while this doesn't sound like a lot, um, discipline and HIV are a big deal. And when they're not handled at the right way or in a time frame, parents get very upset, teachers get very upset, Students get very upset, and it's a mess. But it's a reality of when you cut administration. That is what happens. This is a horrible one, reducing security. No one wants to do that. The coaches and advisors, just to explain what that means, um, no new clubs. So every year, kids come to see Mr. Varela or the assistant principals and say, hey, we have an idea for a club. Uh, Lauren Morris is in the audience, and that's kind of one of her main jobs. And you know, easier job next year, Lauren. We're not having new clubs. Um, you know, no new clubs. And at this point, possibly limiting if the clubs don't have enough kids and not running them. And again, awful, because that's sometimes the only thing a kid wakes up in the morning for. This is middle school B teams. We currently, in our middle school sports programs, have a way for more students to get involved at a B team level. Those, they travel, they get the full feel of being on a regular sports team. That's cut, that's gone. There are no more B teams next year in the middle school. But there will be, because we still want to provide for students as much as we can, we're gonna change the way we do that and we're gonna have intramural sports instead for those B teams where they were. 
It's a lot less expensive to do, and hopefully it'll even get more kids involved in, in whatever those intramural sports wind up being. That'll be helped by the administration, staff, coaches, and C.J. Hendricks over there at the middle school. 10% of the administrative and supervisory staff is currently on the block. And I'd imagine all the staff in this building can attest to this. And people say, well, that's just the way it goes. Well, kids do not benefit when everyone's morale is sunk. That's who suffers at the end. And right now, we probably have about 100 staff, maybe more non-tenured staff, that right now are walking around praying they didn't lose their job. That's the feeling that exists. And I am helpless to solve that. Completely helpless. Can't solve that. So our K-5 will go up to as possibly even as high as 27. Our 6-8 could go as high as 30, and our high school over 30. That's what we're looking at. Now, you do all that, and you have less administrative support, less supervision, less all the other things, this is a recipe for a mess at all levels. So that's on the cut side. That's on the cut side. Let's talk about the fee side. Now, to explain the fees as clearly as I can, if we don't do these fees, these things that we're charging for are disappearing. So the choice is we have fees or we don't have the thing. That's where we are. Now, some of these fees have already been instituted, and parents are relatively used to it, probably. We are going to have to raise them again, like we did last year. Um, we don't think we went too crazy, but we don't have a choice. Let's start with the big one, pay to play. Activities will go up 20% per activity. There's also a family cap of $300. That family cap will move to $350. People ask, what about students who um, are considered free or reduced lunch? They will still, you know, have the same rights they've had before. Um, but this, this just gets us another, it actually saves, a, it saves the, the equivalent of a teaching position in the district. That's what this saves. High school parking fees. Right now you're paying 24 bucks a year, it goes to 60. Not the end of the world, but add it to the list. It's not fun for parents that are paying that. Again, we're not making millions of dollars on these things. We're just trying to do the best we can to cover as much as we can. So advanced placement testing fee. We played around with various options. I want to thank Jeff Ruman for coming up with a, a better viable plan than the one I presented. And um, this is a $25 increase if you pay for a test. So taking a course, still no charge. There used to be a charge. There's no charge. Um, but you, we up the fee, and that again saves about, it brings, it brings one professional back to the district. I don't know what the new lunch prices will be. For those of you that haven't um, seen, what we did is we went out, it's called we put, it, we put our current food service on the street, meaning we've put out that we are open to another food service. That is, David controls that. It's a request for proposals from any other company that wants to be our food service. Um, we don't know what the final prices will be, but we are open to raising prices if it means raising the fee the district gets in return for the food service. Right now, I believe, David, we have a guarantee from our food service of $200,000. We're obviously hoping that we can increase that. And we don't know if we will, because it's a process, and it's a, it's, a legally, it's a legal process that David will follow with his team. Chromebook insurance fee, again, not, I'm not going to make millions on this, but we charge a very nominal fee. It's going to raise. Um, doesn't affect people who are students or families for their students. However, if people rent the facilities, those costs are going to go up. We're going to be charging more to rent facilities. Um, field trips, we subsidize field trips to a small degree. We're not going to be doing that, which just, again, hurts families, you know, paying for these, and these, you know, the cost of busing. The cost of these field trips has skyrocketed, but it's going to have to be fully, fully footed by the students. This is new. Late fee, late bus fee. If you take a late bus, take it for one season, you just 50 bucks, you're in for the season, 100 bucks for the year. That again saves us a position. 
We are also, as we promised we would, implementing subscription busing. This means if you live more than a mile at the K-8 level, you can choose to pay for subscription busing. $720. The rules, I will tell you, will be very strict. You will have to pay up front, in full, by a certain date. That will be t taken by David and Jill. I see Jill's over there. And that's a non-refundable, upfront, full payment. Non-negotiable. You pay for the whole thing, period. We just simply took this model from other districts that are already doing this. And we're implementing it in a very similar way, for a very similar price. If you're in high school, it's 1.25 miles or longer, and you're allowed to access a bus for the cost of $720. That summarizes the general impact. It might not seem like a long list, because I didn't get into specifics from every school, but when you talk about the number of staff we're looking at, both on the professional side and the non-certificated side, while it might not be listed as impact, everything is just going to take a little longer. You're going to take longer to get back to parents with questions. Staff are going to take longer to grade papers when you have more kids in the class. It's just the nature of the beast. I just want you to think you can't cut $6.2 million out of a budget and not have major impact. Yet, we've been doing it for years, and now we can't do it anymore. Can't. So this is the worst news. The way it all is working, if nothing changes, is when next, this time next year, currently, with no difference in anything going on in the state, we will have an $8 million hole to fill with virtually nothing left to cut. There are districts in the state right now who are there. They are already there right now at a number they cannot cut. And my colleagues are just telling the state, we're not doing it. And I will absolutely tell the state next year, if we have eight million, that we are not doing it. And they will say, well, you have to do it. And I'll say, no, I don't, I can almost retire. They could do it if they want to do it. Let them come in here and figure out how to cut eight million dollars next year. I'd love to see that brain trust do it. That's where we are as a district. That is not a made-up number. That is a combination of the, the wonderful stabilization aid we have received up to now, which won't be available in that budget, the rollover, and other things that David is aware of. That's $8 million. It's worse than this year, if nothing changes. So May 7th, I shared with you, is the date that we will be adopting a budget. The budget we will be adopting on May 7th will be minus $6.2 million. I no longer believe there's a chance of that number shrinking by May 7th. We've been working, and I no longer believe it is possible by May 7th, and I hope I get proven wrong. May 15th, statutorily, we have to inform any staff member who will not be offered employment that date. That is the date. So just think of what that means. Right now, I'll just go to the next page. Right now, the legislators are, there is a bill that helps. That bill was passed through the assembly today. It will be voted on by the full assembly on Monday. But if you not remember, because you haven't watched the cartoon in a while, how a bill becomes a law, you need both the Assembly and the Senate to do this. The Senate has, does not have their bill, even though they wrote it. It has not been put up yet. Meaning that bill will not be considered prior to May 7th. It will not. That means even if they tell us on May 16th, hey, we figured it out, and they decide to give us $5 million. We'll have already told all the people, you no longer have a job. I can tell you, once you start telling people they don't have a job, they're already 
I, I, I would have my resume going now. What would I be waiting for? Waiting to get the bad news? We can hope, but you can't live on hope. So if we start s sending out pink slips, the equivalent of a pink slip, on May 15th, and the state finally comes through, let's say, in June, those people are gone. Maybe they'll be around, but there's a lot of jobs out there because while we're getting crushed on money, North Brunswick got another $9 million. Edison got another $20 million. Woodbridge got $24 million, and so on and so on and so on. So we would not expect to have the staff that we love and care about available after we give them a letter saying you don't have a job. We've told the state this. We've told the Senate. We've told everybody this. We've been telling them for years. The sad part is they've been hearing the same message for years, and they're still late to the game. But I'll back up a little. There is... There is a bill. If you want to see the bill, it's Assembly A4161. That bill has its, um, will have a companion bill in the Senate. I don't remember the name for the Senate bill, but it's the same bill. That bill does a few things. One, it returns some of the money they've taken, which is good. But it also allows flexibility in the tax. Now, not everyone will like to hear that because that could mean a raise in taxes. Um, but a flexibility in that would allow a Board of Education to look at tax impact on their community and decide if they would like to access that part of the bill. So that would give any district who qualifies, which we are one of the districts that qualify, there's actually three points. We qualify on all three points, lucky us. So again, I can't speak for anybody. I can do the math. I can tell everybody what the numbers look like, what the impact would be but it becomes a board's job to do that. That is not in play yet. So to be clear, that bill is not law. That would still need to pass through the Senate and then signed by the governor. Now, we believe there is support for this bill in both the Assembly and the Senate, yet it is not going to move in time. The testimony on the advocacy side um, you know, I, I, I was just joking to somebody. I think I just need to move to Trenton. I, I, it seems like I'm in Trenton every day. I was in Trenton today, testifying for 30 minutes, going back and forth with assembly, assemblymen and women, um, going back on Monday, going back on Tuesday. Our advocacy committee had a special meeting the other night to start considering what do we need to do to help. So we're going to be talking now that we have information from today. And, and there's a group of those people that are ready to do, including students, that are just ready to go. But the question is, what is the right direction? And today was a very interesting day, a positive day that ended with a negative, which seems to be the nature of this beast. Before I go over and just hand this over, um, actually, we're going to hold on the board. We're going to open this up to the public. Um, if there are people that would make, like to make a comment or ask a question, I'm just going to ask you to please, if, if you're going to do that, please start coming over here. You're going to use this mic. You don't have to write your name down or anything. You're just going to come up here. You don't have to introduce yourself. Uh, it doesn't matter. Just come up here and ask your question. I'm going to go sit down, and if anyone has a question, come on up. Thank you, Scott. Just for edification purposes, the Senate bill number is S3081. It has been introduced in the Senate. It's been referred to the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee. That is Senate Chair Sarlo, who's the chair of that committee. So it is waiting to be hosted for that committee. Just wanted to clarify. If anybody wants to speak, have a question, please, we um, urge you to uh, come up and any, any question. Sir? Well, I, I have a comment that, uh, first of all, it's ironic that the Senate is not getting this through. We have a senator right in our township. Um, I don't know what he is doing. Um, the powers that be um, that run the show uh, do well politically in South Brunswick, so kind of 
bring it upon our, our, right, ourselves. Sure, yeah. I, I can help give a little Yeah, bit. let him answer. Let I answer. can help give a little bit of insight. So Senator Zwicker um, crafted the bill, and he, I was talking with him today, and he's been trying to get it through. So he is, he is legitimately trying. I can't, I can't say that's good or bad. I can just tell you that that is where we are. But it's not there yet. It's not there. Okay, thank you for, thank you for that comment. Uh, you know, just that they, they do politically well in this town, and I'm sorry, they do politically well in this town, and, they're, and they get a lot of funding from the, the local unions and all, and uh, they're not going to change things unless there's a, a shift in uh, Trenton and, and in, quite frankly, Washington. I, I don't recall you, uh, and I looked up, I did my homework, I uh, read the, you know, saw the videos, <laughs> Um, about federal aid. Um, so uh, federal aid comes in the way of title grants and uh, IDEA funding for special education. That is um, untouched, unimpacted, not impacted in the course of our. So when we budget the entire budget, the part of the budget that is cut has been the state aid specifically, okay. not federal aid. Okay. Approximately how, how much of the f f budget is federal? I'm not going to, I mean, just roughly. No, 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 no. I, happen, I happen to know that, David. What is <laughs> it? No. 11? It's, it's running right about uh, seven, right around seven million. I was going to tell you, it's about seven million. <laughs> 307 million, okay. Okay, just saying that unless there's change, and yeah, I know there's constitutional issues, but, you know, the Constitution could be amendment. It's getting amended all the time. There's a book amendment on, on the ballot, so. The, the constitutional side of things comes with what's called a thorough and efficient education. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, after this year, if we're at eight million next year, we will not be able to meet a thorough and efficient education, and we will take that up with whoever we need to, to oh, your point. Oh, okay. Okay, and uh, you know, just my, my two senses, you know, amend the Constitution. You know, that's where, you know, it's, you know, uh, adequate education might just have to be the way for the state and if the local townships could afford better than they can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments, questions? Anyone, please, please. I have a sure. And I don't expect anyone to have the answer. That's okay. We'll do our best. <laughs> Dave, pay attention. Mm -hmm. Dave, yeah, Dave, pay attention. <laughs> I actually came. Oh, I actually came here on a spur of the moment. I wanted to you get come more closer involved. Come to the mic. Oh, sorry. That's it, good. Wow. <laughs> um, alternative funding. We know more students are coming into the schools because I'm seeing, I mean, a lot of the buildings are already done, but I'm seeing even more. I mean, right off a of major road, that's going to be huge. I can remember back 40 years ago when Franklin Township was basically telling their developers, you can build, but we want free, we want you to give us land. Do we have any kind of arrangement? And I know that wouldn't be the board of directors, but you might know something about oh, we it. We know the answer. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> well, then we've sold ourselves for, yeah, so for the very the, cheaply. The, the township no longer has the right to request that they do that. Um, with, the big, with the big units that are going up, there's a 1,700 unit development off of Northumberland Way behind four executive drive. Oh, yeah. Um, that's the biggest one coming. There's another one with 184 units attached to the orchard by Indian Fields. Um, the big one, the 1,700 units, we actually broached the idea of that. We broached that a okay. while back, a few years back, maybe four or five years yeah. ago, um, to propose that as, as a way. And, and um, that development right now is moving at, I think we were told the other day, at about 200 um, units a clip a year. So while that's going to have an impact, it's not going to have an immediate rush, yeah. which would absolutely crush yeah, us because yeah. the formula takes six years before the enrollment. It gets factored in over a six-year average. So you would never be able to get recoup fast enough. Yeah. That's actually, some of the districts do get stuck with their, like a new, like a, uh, my wife's district is Chesterfield. Um, they were actually the poster child district for underfunded. And the reason was, they grew exponentially, like overnight, and they just could not, they didn't have the money. Um, and the 2% cap causes them unable to collect any money. 
Right. So, unfortunately, your idea is awesome. No, it's not my idea. I'm sure everybody here no, had that long. idea. I just wanted to ask. Now, the question I have, though, is this. Do you guys, or the board of directors, do you coordinate with the zoning, with the people who actually hand out the permits so to build? We, I think it's Barry's own yeah, zone. Yeah, Barry so one of our board members is on, on the zoning board. Okay. So, so, he us can, so he could deny Well, he, he's, he's an individual. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the board can deny. Well. So this board has nothing to do with uh, no, the not board. The zoning, whoever, yeah. the, whoever so the, does the that. So the township has actually South Brunswick has been in a constant battle, fighting these developments. They've been fighting them for years, and they're still fighting them. That is that. Excuse me. That's actually what kept a lot of these developments already from being developed. In fact, when I first got here seven years ago, uh, we met with the township, and the township shared with me at that time, and we even built a strategic plan around this concept. Mm -hmm that um, we were to expect in five years, five to 7,000 new homes to be built. Now that was seven years ago. They've been fighting the entire time to avoid this problem. So they are, that is, the township is doing that, 100%. Okay, it's, it, it's good to know that they're doing that. Um, yeah. I don't know, but with wetlands and the floods and everything else, there's always a reason not to build or to deny it, all right? And, and if you, you know, they don't live here, the developers, so they don't have a stake in this community. Just bringing it to people's attention, and I'm sure everybody here has thought the same way. Well, Thank you very much. It's obviously more complicated, and I knew it was, but okay. I just wanted to hear your we, thoughts. We appreciate you. Thank yeah, you for no that. Problem. Thank you. And just a little comment. The, there was a development that was going to go on by the Holiday, I think it's still the Holiday Inn, on uh, Ridge and Route 1. Yeah. Um, I was actually working with Scott several years ago. I was on the board at that time, fighting that development, going to the court cases. So the town has been actively trying to avoid the building. I know the 55 and older, they were involved in it. So they are doing everything they can. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm not necessarily I'm, you know, well, Let's hold for later. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. But thank you. Yes. Um, so I had noticed earlier on one of the slides it mentioned a cut in special education. And I just was curious if that is going to impact the number of students per classroom that are, um, ha that have IEPs. Because I know legally there's a cap on the number of students in each like in-class support type of a situation. Yeah. So the answer is yes. That's exactly how it will impact, right? If you have less classes, then you have higher class size. In special ed, different than regular ed, as you know, um, there's, there's, there's limits, right? And then there's waivers, and then there's aids, and there's all kinds of things. Um, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a thing we don't ever want to see and hope we don't have to. But once we plug in all the numbers and all that happens, you could see an increase in class size in special education classes, yes. Um, the ratio between this, I mean, I mean more specifically, like the number of children with an IEP in a class for the special oh. ed teacher who's servicing those Got children. It. So an inclusion setting. Yes. Okay. So we won't we won't break the law. Okay. Unless no one's looking. I'm looking. I know. <laughs> I'm always looking. I know. As are I know. most of the parents with children. Trust me, I'm looking also. We're not going to break the law, <laughs> but. We're going to probably go right up to it. Okay. Where we, where we have to. Where we don't have to, we won't. It's not a desire. It could be an outcome. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments, questions? Please. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Rajesh. Uh, you should know me, regular visitor. So. Thank you for the presentation. Again, it's, it's going to be very hard. It is definitely very hard. Um, and we understand that the problem is revenue. But to be honest, I don't see it coming. It's out of our control, and it's best to assume it's not coming. And, and the current approach just appears a little bit like that by 1,000 paper cuts. It's just cutting around the edges. We are not still addressing the problem. So my question is more of an ask to the board and the administration, what strategic solution can we work on now so next year this time we don't go through again more cuts, more class size increase, more cutting all this. There are a number, again, I, last time I came here I spoke, 
Again, I, don't, I know we just spoke about more housing development, but our enrollment numbers are going down. We are going, getting less funding, so I don't know. We are in a pickle. But have we thought of, again, doing a study assessment of consolidating five to four elementary schools? There's a pot of savings there. I know it's hard. Again, it's a study and assessment to do, is it good or not good? In private sector, typically what we do, something like this, you know, a lot of you might know working in it. We hire an EY, somebody, Bain, can we audit our, our biggest spend, capital spend that we do year over year and see if they are still working and giving us the same level of efficiencies that we desired when we started. If not, we can always reevaluate and course correct. And that's nothing wrong with it. So that's another area where we, we, we should more focus on. Another one, we generally, during these times, have a hard and fast rule. Every outsource service evaluate RFP every year. I know increases a lot of work. Believe me, I've done through and it's a pain. But helps helps us reduce costs, generate more efficiencies. So there are a bunch of things like that I'm happy to consolidate, send a note. But that's another area of challenge I have is these comments, I don't know if they are worked on. I'm sure they have been heard, definitely. I see a lot of you nodding. But I don't know if we are acting and there is no sort of feedback loop. So that's another area maybe we as a community should think. How do we log it? How do we document? How do we revert? So I don't come here and again give you the same no. Spiel next time. So, so. Um, I had shared. We did the full RFP, exactly what you said. We did that. Um, and if we need to do it every year, we'll do it every year. It's not a, it's not a work issue. It's just you, you need to find the best ways you can. As far as consolidation of a building, um, there's other ways to look at that outside of just consolidating a building. That's a, that's a math number. But I can tell you that we are very interested in a full study of our existing program, bigger than what you've just described. But right now, we're not talking about that today because that will not happen as of September. However, in the future years, we're going to have to look at bigger deals. So to, to, your, to your point, we don't disagree. It, it takes, um, you, you, you can't keep going at this rate. The, the problem is if nothing changes, regardless of all those things, you'll never get out from under. Even if we close this, it wouldn't make a bit of difference to deal with 6 million, 8 million, 10 million. It doesn't go down. That number is going to keep rising. Um, the revenue situation, you can't reduce the spend to the point where you can't. And, but you can restructure. You can revisit all the things you said. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rajesh, when we do that, welcome to join us in, in, in the partnership. Sure. No, again, I, as I said, these are not short term. Nope. They take time. But next year, again, we don't want to again be in the same situation, again trying uh -huh. to cut corners and again trying to figure it out. And, it's a hard thing. So I think some strategic, and again, I don't know. I'll brainstorm more. I think, but some I think you're going to find is required. You're, we're, we're, we're on the same page. OK. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, and somebody else right there. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for presenting us the details. Um, usually, I attend most of the CUTS meeting. I don't know why. So mostly I hear the wrong side of the stories. A um, couple of points. You mentioned the 65 positions are cutting down and some of the programs are cutting down. You are going to make a decision on the September, May 1st. May 7th. May 7th. My question to you, the programs you are going to cut down, are you going to planning to take input from the township residents? Example, which one is higher precedence, which one has a higher value, which yes. one is a lower value? So I did forget to share at the end that um, we'll be sending out a survey okay. specifically to rank order survey of exactly what you just said. My bad in, in not saying that. Okay. Uh, I'm almost done with the survey. Um, it's a survey that will ask exactly our residents, our staff, and even our students prioritizations. Got because when it comes down to exactly what that looks like at the end, so that's going to be a quick turnaround, um, but no, plenty of time for us because we, we already have our charts and you know, we're there. Absolutely. But we definitely want the town to participate to a degree, right, in what, what is your priority. So I, I, I thank you for saying that because it, it reminds me to make sure I say it. So that survey is coming out. Also in the survey, you are not going to include the programs. You are also going to include, let, let's say for cutting some of the teachers, you're going to include some of the details. Like you cannot name the t 
teacher's name, but you can... Ex yeah, the type of the type of program. Type of the program sure. which would be affected, right? One versus another one. To a degree, but yes. not, not as, that as level much as you can without, you know. Yeah, there, there's 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 a way to do it. So That's it. when you see it, you'll you'll be able to provide your input. Thank you. Um, okay, my notes are gone. <laughs> another point I have, um, again, my notes are gone. So, um, is last. May or June, when we were discussing the budget curve for this year, mm -hmm. you mentioned there was some of the outreach program you are working with your team, which you are going to share it with us, so the township can participate in yes. supporting the township. Did I miss it? I haven't no. heard it. I'm not sure. So Be because because the, the the place I'm going is the cutting you are talking about. I don't think so. You can hire any consulting company, any kind of a program you can do and save that much money. We are talking about 20%. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that, no, no, none of the consolidations, none of the reprogramming will solve that. It's going to hurt the bottom line for all of us. The second question I have is, when we try to cut our own feet to solve our own problem, example, increasing our tax to solve our own problem, where our own elected officials are voting against us to not get the money, and people are not being aware and waking up that the people we are electing are hurting us, not helping us. Okay, that magic formula, I'm not going to go into detail, sucks. It doesn't only cut our own funding, our students, who are graduating with the top marks and top grades are suffering also at the college level admissions. South Brunswick, Plainsboro, Westminster are worsely affected this year with the college admissions. When you vote, don't vote blindly. Think about the facts because the formula which you explain basically says that, hey, if your township doing good, the hell with you. We are going to take more money. We are going to make you suffer and dry you out until you are the level of the lowest level school in the township. I don't know whether we can fight financially. You can increase the tax 2%, 3%. I don't think so. They are going to find a way to take that money as well. This is the way to take our intelligence to the average intelligence of the state, that hurts us, doesn't help us. What I am saying is, we need to be open. Rather than hiding, be open, tell us who is voting where. You know, that is, you go to the Trenton, we don't. We don't know who is voting, who is supporting us. So as a board member, we are asking you to help us, to let us do what we can do at our part. Yeah. Who is supporting us, who is not supporting us, who is hurting us. So, so let me help. So um, our locals are, um, Senator Wicker is a local, Assemblyman Fryman, Assemblyman Drulis are local. Um, they are the proponents of the bills to try and solve some of the issues. They are the ones who are, they're not, they are the ones who are writing the bills, they are the ones who are trying. Um, but to your question of who, who, who's our blockers, right? Yes. They're, they're, they're not the local, unfortunately. When we say local, they're state. They're, they're not. I'm talking the states, but yeah. I said local. Yeah, the state. Yeah, it's all, it's all local. There's no. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, of our, one of our things that we are going to do, we're actually, I actually asked um, the assembly, assemblyman today, who, who do we need to, like, who is, who is it, right? Your question, who is it? So let's flood that person. Let's, let's get that person on the blocks. So we are going to be meeting again with our advocacy committee and ready to launch exactly what you're describing, which will include the town. So the other night we have people in this room right now that have already done a tremendous amount of work, ready just to hit the send button, to be honest with you. And I held them off because of the bill information I received and today. Um, unfortunately, it didn't quite come out as we had thought it was going to come out today. Um, we have a few more days of a little bit of hope left, but it isn't much because the, the deadline will not be met. So um, we're not ready to, to say there's nothing out there yet. Our, our, our people, to your point, our local people are fighting hard. They are the ones who are fighting hard. Um, but to your point about getting the families involved um, and identifying the who. 
or what we can do, how, that's, and that's, which way we can. That, that, that's part of it, right? Yeah, what yeah. do we do? Who do we do it? Like, who do we talk to? Who do we say? Yes. What do we do? That's exactly what the plan is. Awesome. Please, do you have any target deadline to reach, send us that plan? Uh, that, that plan will be by early next week at the latest. Yeah. That would be great. Um, one other question I have is about busing. You said plus one mile. Does that mean a one mile from the school or three miles from the school? One mile from their school. One mile from the, regardless of walking path, not walking path. Doesn't matter. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. One mile for the K through. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just trying to make sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyone else? Because I will. Oh, we, we got another one. Great. We have a student. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just gra gra grab the Turn mic. Turn the mic, yeah. There you go. Sorry. There you go. Yeah. So uh, I looked at the budget for New Jersey as a state as a whole, and I noticed that they actually increased their education budget. Mm -hmm. And my question is if that's true, and all of these other schools are gaining a lot of revenue, or, or like districts are gaining a lot of revenue, like Newark gained like $100 million. Are we effectively competing with all these other districts for money? Um, it's a great question. It's a great question. So in the last two years, the 425 school districts received 1.8 billion new dollars. At the same time, about 140 school districts lost about $270 million in those two years. So to your point, effectively, you could easily look at it as a competitive situation. Our neighbors are North Brunswick, who received last this year nine million, and the last two years prior to that, six million each year. You mentioned Newark. They received 100 million four years in a row, and 400 million during COVID. That's 800 million, new money. Uh, at the same time, um, we're down 43% of our state aid, and a district like Edison right down the road has received over 40 million in two years. Woodbridge, over 40 million in two years. Now, the reason they say is related to this formula. Um, we've gotten pretty fancy with this formula ourselves. And while the formula spits out its numbers, what it's done is it also has caused districts to be funded in an inadequate, to use their terms, under adequacy. Our district is considered under adequacy by the state formula that is then used to take money away, right? So um, I think you phrase it interestingly, and if you don't mind, I might steal that for Monday, um, that that's what they're causing, right? They're causing this effectual competition of school districts when we're all supposed to be trying to do the same thing. Um, so, in addition to that, uh, according to Niche.com, I found that not only Newark, but also Patterson, Elizabeth, um, included all of them, they actually spend more per student than we do. So, is really the only reason we're being punished for this because of the fact that we have all those um, warehouses? Yes. In fact, if we didn't have the warehouses sales, then, and I explained this to the assembly today, if, if the year before um, our value of the town went up $1.3 billion in one year, and that was the 18-19 school year, we received money from the state. And then overnight, the evaluation went up $1.3 billion. And that caused us to move from receiving money to losing money. So their formula accounts what's called the wealth factor. And that's one of the wealth factors, income and town's value by real estate. Unfortunately, when you sell real estate um, that was purchased very low and sold very high, it has a massive impact to the value of the real estate market. And that's what's happened in our case. So it isn't, it isn't necessarily the reduction of, of pupils. In fact, we've already demonstrated mathematically to them that it's not related to, it doesn't help to lose students. So that has a little impact, but nothing comparatively to the amount of money they've taken. And one last question. So I know you've been working a lot with, um, or you've been like working with the Senate or like the Assembly, all of that. So my question is, because um, 
you did say that they are someone on board with this and it's okay if you don't want to answer. In your honest opinion, do you think we can trust them to make sure this doesn't happen for 2025 to 2026? What, what do they call it? Taking the what is it? The fifth. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> All right. uh, thank I'll you. leave it as my Wait. honest answer is I don't want to answer. All right. You can infer from that answer anything you like. All right. uh, thank you. You guys taught him inference, right? <laughs> what, thank you. Can I just ask you, what is your name? Uh, Om Bosco. Oh, oh, Om, yes, I know you. Okay. <laughs> um, Om was one of the... Uh, one of the students that actually testified. Oh, uh, no, 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 that's, no, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> Sorry, one. the other Om. Different Om. Yeah. Um, different Om. But anyway, you need to testify. Oh. Um, yeah. Seriously. Um, and, and I don't know who your teachers are, and your parents should be really proud of you because of two things. One, you did your research. You looked at the data. You didn't assume. And I cannot commend you enough on the behalf of this board. And Mr. Federer, thank you for doing that. Um, I'm sorry, I have to say something. So thank you for doing that. And I don't know what your career aspirations are, but you need to like get in politics. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate everything you've just said. Thank you. Other own, oh, sorry. Any other comments, questions? Before I'm gonna open it up to the board for questions, so. You, okay, that's fine. All right, that's fine. And that was really good. I don't, I don't see you here, but there he is. Where is he? Right in the middle. Ah, <laughs> there you are. Um, that's really what I. One of the other things I was getting at, though, if our, if our value of this township has gone up. What are the taxes going on with these big boxes out on Route 130, et cetera? I, that can't be okay, restricted. No, and I'm sorry if you, I know you said you've yeah, addressed this, but I'm new to this. this. I'm going to go real fast. So what happens when um, more money comes into the town? It doesn't get collected. It gets spread out. So the reason, like, for example, we've raised the budget every year. Yet the taxes on the average home in South Brunswick over six years is minus $56. And that's because of the values, of the valuations. But we haven't collected any new money. You don't get money. It just spreads the money. And that's a hard explanation for the Senate and Assembly to understand, but we've been trying to get them to understand there's no new money. But thank you. Um, we're going to, looks like we're good. Let's close yep, out. Yeah, we're good. All right, we're going to close out the public questions, and we're going to open it up now to the board. I just want to say, can I just say before you do that? Please do. Just uh, thank you guys for coming and for uh, the questions, and um, th there's more to come. Um, we just have to wait to see what that is going to be. But to Rajesh uh, Sony's uh, point, we do need to do exactly what he said, and we've been talking about a plan to really look at the way we structure ourselves. But that's going to be something we'll start diving into after this is this is over. Um, so, so thank you for that. And again, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Any questions from the members of the board? I just want to make a comment. We've been involved in this, members of the board, so we're pretty much brought up to speed on everything. But I do want to be respectful and ask if they have any questions. To my right, we're good. Yep. To my left, Dr. Raj. That's okay, Dr. Raj. Uh, so, Can you uh, bring the microphone okay. closer? Uh, the subscription busing, it is per year, right? $720 per student I'm per sorry, year. The what? Uh, subscription bus, yes. uh, the number that's uh, on the slide, $720 per year per student, right? Per year per, per year, student. Per, so uh, is the district breaking even on that, or uh, is there a subsidy component built in? The only way we were able to even offer it was in a way that um, we had to look at the distance. We had to look at the number of potential customers for it and the number of available seats to see exactly what we'd be able to do. We will not lose any money okay. on this issue. Okay. Um, and the other thing, uh, uh, the field trips uh, will be fully paid for, right? So uh, will the reduced lunch families... Um, reduced lunch always... They get a subsidy Always component. is covered. Okay. No matter what the fee. Um, and uh, the class size projections um, that were there, does it factor in the new uh, new potential uh, yes. uh, potential from the new? It does. Okay. 
Uh, and the other thing is, uh, this is a more uh, general question I had. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, most advocacy organizations and lobby groups, they use uh, platforms like UJOIN and Vote a Voice uh, to reach out to lawmakers. Uh, it's pretty simple. There will be a standard letter, and uh, people just need to do that one click exactly. thing. Uh, so what is it, it called? The Act Action, Lisa, Action Network? Yeah. yeah so oh, ours okay. is what we call the Action Network. Okay. 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 Yeah, they That's sent it. To us. Thank you. Yeah, I have some questions. Yep, Mr. Hernandez. Um, so I just want to clarify, someone asked about federal funding, and you said it comes in the form of titles. And that's, each title though is for very specific yes. things. We can't use that like we do state funding. Yeah, we can't move title money to wherever we want it. It's directed for certain areas. Basically, Suzanne runs most of that, uh, and Evelyn. And um, the IDEA is the other place you see some mm -hmm. real federal funding. But that's all specific to it's special education, specific. and then a percentage of the uh, federal money for IDEA also can be spent on regular education on how you're doing preventive work. So all of that is uh, predetermined, and then um, we work within those frameworks. Okay. Um, and then also, uh, someone also asked about how we could find out who voted which way. It, isn't that made public at some Absolutely. point, right? So, so they're able to go public. At least. So, just very quickly, when you when you're curious to know how a, a legislator votes, um, you can go to njlegislature.com. I think it's the New Jersey Legislature. You can look that particular bill up, and under the bill, you could actually see um, the name of the person on that committee. Um, who voted a certain way, as well as the full Senate when they vote or the full Assembly. You can see I that. I will say today's bill passed out of the Assembly. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. And then also I know that Senator Zwicker and um, the people that work under him are fighting um, if we for the tax levy bill. Am I correct? They're for fighting for the comprehensive package to how we can attack the issue of revenue. Okay. So are they fighting to get us back? I know they're, so we can have the flexibility, but are they fighting to get money There's back? There's two parts. Yes. One part is getting money back, and one part is flexibility. And they're fighting for both of them. Both. Okay. It's in one bill. Okay. And just to clarify, that's Bill S3081 that's sitting, waiting to go into the Senate Appropriations and Budget Committee. It hasn't been posted there yet. Any other questions, Mr. Mitchell? Yes, I do have a question. Um, Thank for you, Mr. Uh, middle school sports, are student athletes or students uh, required to pay the pay to play? Yes. I'll say, okay, so even if they're on the B squad, they're also. Do I have a middle school? Yes, the answer is yes. So if a parent comes up to you and asks you, how do you justify getting rid of the B program or the B team? Sure. When they're paying to play. Well, they, they would no longer be paying to play. The pay to play doesn't cover the full cost. It's an offset. Mm -hmm. So we're and this able, is what they need to know. We're able to net, it's, it's $25,000. Mm -hmm. We're netting that, but we're also going to be able to offer Ac, um, activities, sports in an intramural session instead of the bees. So we're not erasing the opportunity mm -hmm. because we do know that's a, a priority from all the groups that we've met with so far. Um, but we're able to do this in a different way, which saves the $25,000. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? One last time. Ms. Ms. Karthik. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, it got me thinking when uh, Dr. Come Raj asked. Closer. Asked the question about subscription busing. Um, so I know that we had discussed this some time back. Uh, is there a sort of a, a critical um, sort of um, you know mass that we need? Uh, because you know if I if I have a K to eight within one mile and I don't have uh, the critical mass to sort of you know apply yeah. for subscription busing, no, then even though I'm willing to pay for it, so we I'm not able to we get set it. this up to be um, foolproof. We can't lose. We, are not, we do not need a critical mass. We just need the number of students who are interested, and we will not lose. Okay. And I have the best director of transportation on the planet. <laughs> and yes, Joe. Uh, she has designed this in a way that allows for two things. One, the district to make sure it's profitable. Not low, low, we don't really. It's not that it's a place you want to necessarily make a fortune. You're not going to make a fortune, but it is guaranteed to not lose money, and is guaranteed to be available for any of the families who fit that criteria. Okay, 
And um, the other question I had was regarding the clubs. Um, I know that it's going to impact um, advisors and new clubs, and that's going to be part of pay to play as well, right? Uh, all the clubs are pay to play. But in terms of support for uh, the coaches and the advisors. So, for example, if there is a club that's on the, you know, on the axe that's going to be asked, can we have, uh, you know, included in the survey so that people know that, okay, if you want this club, you'll have to now support not just the club, but also the advisors associated with the club. So, so right now, that is what pay to play is. That's exactly, you just described it. It, it is paying for part, portions of the cost to operate. So that's how the clubs generally work. So the, the idea of being able to say, we're going to lose the, um, I don't know what club, the water club. And um, normally it's $100 to join the water club, but because that's the one we've chosen, we're gonna charge families $200 for the water club. No, we won't do that. We wouldn't be able to decide one club at a time who's gonna pay more for their club. That would be very problematic. Uh, our, our goal isn't to cut the clubs, it might be, um, limiting enrollment. It might be not holding a club if there isn't enough of a, of a turnout. And let's say we were using, I don't know, Lauren, what is our number that we, is it Lauren? She left. Um, Harley, do you know? What, what number do we, what, what number does a club need to have in it to, to be a club? Do you know that? Anyone from the? It's a Okay. So, so that's what could be impacted, is start putting numbers to those things, where seven is not gonna be enough possibly. So we haven't identified which clubs, that isn't the way it's gonna work. It's gonna work by looking at everything and trying our best to hold everything, but just acknowledging, I'm putting it up there because it's an acknowledgement. I don't want to not say something today and then someone come back, you said you didn't say this on April 11th. So these things are all up in the air as possibles. Ms. Ferrar? Yes, Mr. Fetter, I wondered about uh, the placement testing comment uh, in your presentation um, and wondered also about uh, whether you know other districts who charge for AP courses since they're credit-based courses and will we be doing that? So we looked at both charging for the course and how we would do that versus charging for the test. So we upped the charge for the test instead of doing the charge for the course um, as a way to still make a similar amount of money than we were looking at to charge for the class itself. It was a cleaner, it was a cleaner way to operate the same outcome. So one of the things if you start charging for a class to take is, you know, it almost becomes collegiate in the sense that the bursar's office is gonna call the kid down and say, hey, you know, your parents didn't pay your fee, we're gonna to have to move you to honors. And we don't really wanna be in the business of chasing people down. When you sign up to take the test, you pay. If you don't pay, you don't take the test, it's that simple. That's why we went that way instead of the other way. So you can take a weighted course without testing? You can take the course without testing. And you still maintain college credit? I do not believe so. Okay. The credit comes from, depending on the college you go to, and right. depending on your test. Right. So, you, so my, a clarification, if I want, as a student in high school, to take an AP course, and I want it to have credit for my future college, I must take placement testing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. For that college. Okay. They answered. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any, other, you. <laughs> any other questions, comments? Okay, so I just have one. Um, if you can just clarify, Mr. Fetter, one point, because I know it comes up quite a bit, is preschool funding. Um, this is not touched, and why? Uh, preschool funding is 100% separate from our K-12 funding. It is a program called Preschool Expansion Aid. It is 100% only usable for preschool, and it is determined by enrollment. Uh, we actually received an increase there because we were able to expand our number of preschoolers. So while I don't know that we'd be able to you know, move the money, if we, even if we could, the idea here is the long-term impact, if you can get our kids in our schools at three years old, there should be a long-term impact to other services you'll need over time. 
So it's an incredibly good program, and I, it's the one area I do give the state credit for even a good design. I don't like to give the state too much credit, especially right now. But the design is, is interestingly done, and um, it's, a, it's a very huge, it's a huge positive for the community. But it is completely separate, so thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, Ms. Ferrer. Um, just for the public information, um, does the stabiliz stabilization aid that we usually can get um, when we uh, receive that from the state, does that come through the uh, State Board of Education or does it come straight directly through the State Department of Education? Uh, it comes ultimately through the Treasury, through the Department, Department of Education. And do you believe that with these new bills that might change, uh, that the stabilization aid system will still stay in place? Well, I, I have no interest in stabilization aid. Right. They can take it and you know what with it. But okay. um, I'm also not dumb. I'm not going to not take money if they give it to us. Right. But we do not want a solution where they take our money from state aid and give it back to us in phony money. That's not a plan. So stabilization isn't something you just get. It's only been issued in the last two years. Yeah, it's not, it's, a, it's, it's okay. three, well, three, three stabilization packages, but two years. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this bill has another stabilization package in it. Um, and again, we'll, we'll take it. But just remember, for those that don't know, when you take stabilization aid, it's just like a million dollars, that means I'll use it this year, but then when it's not given to me next year, I'm minus a million. That's why I'm minus eight million next year already, because of stabilization aid, which has helped us through one year. Don't talk. But right the, 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 actually, the okay. example I used is, I'm gonna use, so, I don't know if I should use this here, but if you have a bookie, you know, kids, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> if you owe someone money, and they say, you know, we're going to let you take a year to pay it back. You pay more. And that's our problem. These numbers go up. So there's no interest in stabilization aid except for we'll take it because it's money. Okay, thank you. Last trips. Please. We got another question. Yes, I'm sorry. Right. Yes, where's the question? Oh, Ms. Carter. <laughs> Just for, I just wanted uh, you to clarify your efforts in trying to reduce uh, the impact to security with the township, with the shared services conversation, so in case somebody missed that. Uh, just repeat your question. So I know that the administration has been having conversations through the shared services to reduce the impact for security to schools. So I just wanted you to provide some insight into the efforts that you've put in to sort of mitigate that. Yeah, so we, we meet with the township. Um, one thing we just recently, um, we've talked about it before, but we, we made a, an official request of sorts um, to reduce our portion of the cost for our current um, police officers that work in the district. And we're waiting for a response, which they just, they just got the question, so. Thank you. Yep. On the AP, I thought that was a good question, and I also like the fact that we are not charging for AP, and the reason I like that is because it allows the student that may not be able to afford to get into that AP class, it gives them the ability to be taught in preparation for college, and so I commend you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, this well, is Jeff Ruman gets the credit well, for that. Jeff, so thank, thank Jeff. you um, for that. Um, I just want to make one final comment. We are working with this advocacy committee. Uh, we were on a call, several of us, Tuesday night, um, worked with Scott till 10, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night to put together this plan. Um, it's coming. So the advocacy committee, wait for the update, because what the plan will be to do an email phone call attack on every single senator that needs to push this through. Um, so be ready, everybody. Um, we need everyone to do this, family, friends, neighbors, grandparents, everybody. So when you get that notification, please step up. It's going to be super easy. Um, you don't have to do much work. Pretty much press a button or two, and that'll be it. So just be ready for it. No, 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 no. Oh, we closed it out already. You could comment just, shortly. Just okay. Hold, hold. Yep. Anything else? No. Oh, okay. No. Keep moving. So I just wanted to comment on that. Any other comments? No? All right. So this will close out the um, section of the budget presentation. Thank you, Mr. Fetter. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Marianne, Marcia, Marcia, excuse me, I always do that, and everyone in the office that helped put this together. All right, next is board committee and liaison reports. I'm gonna start with my left side. My, Mr. Mitchell, any update? Oh my 
<laughs> I'll skip you. That's okay. Um, Ms. Hernandez, any update? <laughs> yeah, uh, the Education Committee met on March, I gotta take my glasses off, March 21st. Um, present was myself, Dr. Raj, Ms. Karthik, Ms. Rogers, Mr. Fetter, Dr. Mammon, and Ms. Luckborn were at the meeting. We just kind of wrapped up some stuff that we'd spoken about at the previous committee meeting, uh, book placement, grade level. We just continued on the process of that. Uh, Dr. Mammon just kind of closed that out for us. We talked about um, Hajib. Hajib. Hajib data we talked about um, previously. We just kind of wrapped up how that um, played out at our middle school. Um, we, I brought up class trips, a, a trip in general that was actually a PTO fundraiser, and that was it. Very good. Any question for Ms. Man Hernandez? No. All right. Well, uh, we'll just jump. I know the um, buildings operations. Mr. Nathans is not ill today, so we have no update right now for um, but uh, for building and operations. My apologies. Um, policy. Any update on policy, Ms. Khan? We have not had a policy committee meeting, so I have no updates right now. Thank you. And Mr. Mitchell, finance <laughs> committee. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> That's uh, all right. <laughs> I kind of jumped on you there. Um, just wanted to report that we did meet on the, Mar on the 19th of March, and in attendance was uh, Mr. Nathanson, uh, Ms. Ferrara, uh, our President Rogers, Superintendent Fetter, Board Secretary Pulowski, Ms. Malloy White, uh, Ms. Luckborn, Mrs. Luckborn, and Dr. Evelyn Mammon. And uh, we went over, it was a brief meeting, we went over budget stuff, of course, uh, discussing our funding and current state of affairs, um, which a lot of that you've heard here already. Uh, we reviewed current tiers of program and staffing cuts, which you've heard here tonight. Uh, also review current fee increases as well as changes to shared service agreements, which we haven't talked about tonight. Um, also, finally, we talked about and reviewed the work of the advocacy committee and bills that are making their way through the assembly. Um, and, and we thank the advocacy committee for the work they've done up to this point um, on a personal note. Um, and that's my report. Thank you so much. Any liaison reports? None? Oh, okay, Mr. Mitchell. I had the privilege of visiting, uh, last week was my spring break, and I had the privilege and honor of visiting several schools last week, and um, had a wonderful, wonderful time, was treated to some um, enlightening experiences. I got to walk, I, I got to walk the schools, got to see kids walking and interacting in the hallways, um, and it was just an overall enlightening experience for me. Um, I'll share with you what schools I did visit, uh, Crossroads South, thank you Principal Cates. Also Indian Field miss, with Mr. Rattine and Mrs. Dubois, thank you. Uh, Cambridge with Ms. Pemberton, thank you so much. And Dayton and Dean's Preschools with Mrs. Plummer. That was the highlight. <laughs> <laughs> that was the highlight the because those little kids, <laughs> <They're> the <best. laughs> they were so special. Yes. <laughs> they were so special. And I, I just want to thank uh, Dr., uh, uh, Superintendent Fetter uh, for your support and allowing me to do these things because uh, it, it just meant a lot, uh, not only to staff for me to come there, but for me to be able to be there and, and support them and to encourage them. Um, they're doing a great job, folks. Um, it's not something that we make up. Yep. I got to see it firsthand, so uh, uh, thank you again, and that's all I have to say. Very good, thank you. Any other liaison? No, Ms. Karthik? The high school PTO had its uh, uh, monthly PTO meeting, which I attended. Uh, they also invited uh, Ms. Jennings uh, to uh, you know, give a talk on how to write college essays, which was very helpful. Unfortunately, I couldn't stay for the whole time because we had our advocacy committee meeting right at the 30-minute mark, but uh, the PTO always does a wonderful job of having these meetings and also bringing interesting topics. So I just wanted to provide an update to the board on that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, okay. Administrator, Ms. Maharaj from Cambridge uh, Elementary School. 
Thank you. So <laughs> sorry about that. Quite a quite a quite a road trip you had. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. This will close that section of the agenda out. Next, we will be moving on to public comments on agenda items only. And I get to read my statement. Just one second. Okay. So the Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public <clears throat> to express themselves on school matters of community interest. Complete copies of policy 0167, which govern this portion of the meeting, are available to the public at the auditorium entrance online or by contacting the Board of Ed office. To permit the fair and orderly expression of comments, we ask that participants be recognized by the presiding officer and preface comments by announcing his or her name, place of residence, and group affiliation, if appropriate, and by completing the sign-in sheet. Please print legibly, or we may be unable to document your name for the permanent record. Each participant may made, I'm sorry, one more time. Each statement made by a participant shall be limited to three minutes. No participant may speak more than once on the same topic. Mr. Pawlowski will indicate when you have 15 seconds remaining. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. No participant may address or question board members. No discussion between a participant and respondent shall extend the three-minute time limit. It is our plan to listen to each member of the public. Once all questions and comments from all members of the public are made, the Board of Ed may respond or respond via email in the most timely and efficient manner available. All questions and comments made will be noted. Please note, the presiding officer may interrupt, warn, or terminate a participant's statement when the statement is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. <clears throat> I'm sorry. A, a request an individual to leave the meeting when that person does not observe reasonable decorum. Interrupt and or warn a participant when the statement, question, or inquiry is abusive, obscene, or may be defamatory to the member of the board. Request the assistance of law enforcement officers in the removal of a disorderly person when that person's conduct interferes with the orderly progress of the meeting. Call for a recess or an adjournment to another time when the lack of public decorum so interferes with the orderly conduct of the meeting and waive these rules when necessary for the protection of privacy or the efficient administration of the board's business. The first public comment is for consent agenda items only. There will be a second opportunity for the public to comment on any time. Mr. Pawlowski, do we have any members who pre-registered? Uh, no pre-registrations, but I missed paragraph four. Can you repeat that one? <laughs> I have to. There's a lot of people here, and I want to make sure they all know the rules. <laughs> gotcha. gotcha. Any public comment on agenda items only? Yeah. And and do you have any anybody in the audience that would like to make a public comment? All right. I'm coming. Thank you. <laughs> all right. We will move on. Um, See, I got me all screwed up. Okay. No no further comments. We will close this portion of the public comments. Next order of business is a consent agenda review by Mr. Pawlowski. Mr. Pawlowski, please review. All right, consent agenda this evening. We have our standard bills list. We're accepting a donation from the PTO at Indian Fields. We're doing a withdrawal from the Community, Ed Fund, excuse me, community Education Fund. Um, we had some funds left in there from years ago. We have a withdrawal from our cafeteria fund balance. Uh, withdrawal from our summer institute. All of those withdrawals are due to, or based on our budget from last year that we're, that we're working in this current year. We have an approval for an adjustment to the tentative budget. We're talking about health care waivers in motion 1617. We're accepting um, the acceptance of chapter 192, 193 non public uh, funds. We have a transportation contract, renewals, authorization use of concession procurement process for. Um, naming of our um, sports complex at the high school. We'll see if anybody bites on that. We have an approval to purchase over the bid limit for our Wilson language training, which is all uh, grant funded. We also are looking at purchasing, uh, oh, excuse me, we're, we have a project that we're funding through a withdrawal from capital reserve funds for a roof project at Cambridge. Um, and then we have our travel. We have HIV, uh, student field trips, and we have some extension of some professional services for students with special needs. And we have some out-of-district placements, uh, tuition adjustments, 
and then we have the second reading and adoption of our policies. And that's your uh, consent agenda this evening. Very good. Thank you so much, Mr. Pulaski. Any questions from the board regarding the consent agenda? No questions? Oh. Mr. Pulaski, I have heard a refrain. I'm refraining from 1.12 because of the reimbursements, right? 1.12? We, we all have the, uh, the uh, NJSBA convention reimbursements there. You see that? Yeah. Um, Am I abstaining from that? Hold on, so just one minute. It's okay. not a payment. You're just approving the trip. Just, just We're approving. just approving the travel. So you're not, okay, so you're not I, getting okay. the you're okay. not getting the reimbursement yeah. just yet. Any other comments, questions for Mr. Pulaski? No, I close that portion. Mr. Pulaski, roll call, please. Roll call. Yes, Here we go. Uh, Ms. Julie Ferrara. Uh, yes, except for 1.11. Oh, no, it's from the policy. Is that a no on 1.11? Yes. Ms. Uh, Laura Hernandez? I'll show it to you. Yes. Uh, Ms. Deep Karthik? Yes. Ms. Alicia Khan? Yes. Mr. Raja Krishna? Yes. yes. Mr. Mike Mitchell? Yes. Dr. Smitha Raj? Yes. Mrs. Lisa Rogers? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. This is the um, this is the second opportunity for public to comment on any matter. On any matter, you are reminded of the previous statement. I will not read it again. Um, of the rules of policy zero one six seven. Again, at the podium, state your name, spell your name, and announce your place of residence and or your group affiliation. Complete the sign-in sheet, and you are limited to three minutes. Do we have any members pre-registered, sir? We do not. Are there any members of the audience that would like to make any comment on any item? Nope. Okay, we will close that portion of the public comments. Please note that the next scheduled Board of Ed meeting is set for Thursday, April 25th. The next item is we have to move into executive session, so until I finish reading the statement, please do not leave the dais. May I have a motion to go into the executive session? Sec and a second. second. So we have a move by Mr. Mitchell, second by Dr. Raj. All in favor? Aye. Any nays? Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Township of South Brunswick hereby moves into an executive session in accordance with the Sunshine Law, Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975, NJSA 1046 through 10421, to discuss the following student discipline matter and shared services. Be it resolved that discussion conducted in executive session can be disclosed to the public at such time as the matters have been resolved. Formal action may be taken at next meeting. We are now moving into executive session. Thank you, South Brunswick, and good night.